So it is my privilege to introduce Professor Margaret Stack, who has been awarded the Donna's Julius Grown Prize in recognition of her career contributions to tribophorosion research and for services to the international tribology community. Margaret has been an academic researcher in the UK since 1986, completing her master's, PhD and Doctor of Science at the University of Manchester. In 2001, Margaret moved to the University of Strathclyde, where she started a tribology group and was appointed Professor of Mechanical Engineering. Margaret's work has included a wide spectrum of engineering applications, and recent work has looked at mapping microclimate variables using meteorological data to inform erosion testing of coatings and materials for wind turbines. Margaret's work contributes to the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals to end poverty, protect the planet and ensure prosperity for all. And you can read a lot more about Margaret's fantastic career in tribology on our IMECI Donald Grown webpage. But uh, I'd now like to ask you to join me in welcoming Professor Margaret Stack, the winner of this year's Donald Julius Grown Prize, to give her talk on tribocorrosion of materials perspective in the renewable energy transition. Thank you, Margaret. Evie, the pointer. Evie, the pointer. Evie, the pointer. Yeah, thanks very much. Thank you, thank, thank you to the IMECI for um, uh, this award. I was very surprised to hear the news, uh, and uh, um, I had a few people who were actually prompting me to to look at the email um, when um, when I heard the news. But anyway, uh, the um, it was also nice to see that David. I think uh, he's, he probably, like everybody else, he's you know traveling is, is a bit difficult. But David Hill. Uh, book on uh, book he edited on fretting and fatigue. Um, it was one of the first jobs that Brian Briscoe gave me uh, when uh, the late Brian Briscoe uh, uh, was editor of Tribology International. It was nice to see uh, David getting his award uh, tonight. Um, right, um, I've I've kind of this is kind of a little bit of a mixed bag in terms of giving everybody perspective of what we we've, we've been doing in in the group in. Um, Renewable energy and um, tribology in, the, in these fields, and um, just some, some of the some of the new developments. So basically, I just thought for the younger folks um, to uh, uh, what do I see now? Right, where is my thing? Did I leave it there? I did. Right. Um, for the younger folks, I just thought right um, after. So many years working in the field, I did my my, my PhD, I started my PhD in um, 1987. So it's been a long, long time in in the field. But I just thought uh, just a little, a few insights to start with. Um, and as we all know, um, we had uh, a very famous uh, uh, artist uh, person uh, passed away last week. Uh, Shane McGowan. Some of you would you all know the 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 the, um, the song Fairy Tale of New York, which is predicted to become number one for Christmas. But anyway, um, one of the lines is, I could have been someone, uh, but so could anyone. You took my dreams from me when I first found you. So I think I was thinking about this last night when I was preparing the talk, and I was thinking, well, that's the allegory for my career in the subject of tribology. Once I found the, the subject, and uh, in particular, the, the field of erosion, um, it was something like it was something that drew me into the into the into the field, and and basically that was it. Then I was kind of sold on it. Having having come to academia as a, as a sort of a reluctant um, sort of a student uh, initially, I, I, I was it was sort of a, something a kind of a, a kind of a, if you like a bit of an awakening for me. So. Um, uh, I, in my in the citation in the on the IMAKE website. I'm, my mother, who was uh, also an academic, a secondary teacher in, in the school in County Kerry in Ireland. And um, now I'm mentioning it particularly uh, this year because it's the 50th anniversary for passing. 
But one of the things that she was interested that I pursue was actually a career in dress design. So she she had me sort of give, give, give me a whole load of, she was used to give me a whole load of drawing pads and uh, sort of uh, you know markers and all sorts of things. And she and she had it in mind that I was going to be become a dress designer. You know, she had sort of careers mapped out for all of us. So um, it's a long way, I think, from that sort of career to, to actually leading edge erosion uh, issues and uh, modeling and on the right hand side, leading edge er- er- erosion issues and on wind turbines and, and modeling and mapping of uh, erosion growth. So a little bit of a stretch uh, in terms of putting those two careers together. But um, uh, I have continued on the kind of the artistic endeavours in, in my spare time when I can, um, you know, in, in, in sort of uh, as a little bit of a kind of a break from the from the career. So what's an, uh, this is an example of leading edge erosion and this paper that we actually pu- published, uh, it's a review paper for, uh, which we published in J15 in 2013. But um, as you can see here, uh, it's 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 the erosion of of a wind turbine. A problem with the with the wind turbine that um, once it starts to wear away and once the surface becomes deformed and uh, uh, the efficiency of the energy process or the energy conversion process reduces, and therefore we have to think about changing uh, the surface, improving the surface by repairing the coating. Or alternatively, if it gets so bad, we actually have to take the the the, the, the turbine down and um, and uh, and replace it. Now, as difficult as this is in the onshore environment, and uh, can you imagine what it's like for an offshore wind farm having to take something like this this down? You have to hire out a ship, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and the maintenance of these things and repair or replacement could be in the millions, just even for one turbine, one or two turbines to actually to be uh, replaced. So you have to think about the importance. We have to think about the importance of understanding how we can reduce degradation and also how we can um, um, monitor uh, the degradation so that, you know, that we can we have some confidence in expected life. And one of the limitations at the moment on in terms of the kind of the costing of offshore uh, wind uh, energy is the the kind of the, the kind of the the parameter that uh, that the the developers can put on uh, the the cost of this kind of uh, materials issue. Uh, these kinds of costs are are, are being difficult to uh, assess, and therefore it, it, it's a kind of it's an area that needs to be addressed. In, in this field in order to make the, 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 the process more competitive. Now, this is, the, this is um, why I suppose Scotland got um, so, uh, so um, uh, involved in, um, in uh, wind energy. This is a mean wind speed map of the UK. And you can actually see you know, the, the darker contours are off the west coast of Scotland. You see, actually, in the north of Wales and uh, parts of Wales as well, you, you get high high wind speeds. So we have we have uh, um, great uh, potential for energy ca- capture uh, uh, in terms of uh, nat- the natural resource that we have uh, from wind in the uh, in the UK. Okay, now Ireland. Um, this is a bit of me. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, in, in recent times uh, outside Limerick Race Course, and Ireland is very well known for its uh, its uh, sports and the turf area. Okay, so um, but what is less well known is that Ireland has a very uh, abundant uh, uh, energy resource in in wind, and uh, this is a, a European uh, wind uh, speed map. You can see off the west coast of Ireland. Including the coast of, uh, including the coast of Kerry and Galway, those two counties I'm very familiar with. Um, uh, uh, you can see very high um, contours, and that means this means I think I've lost the the um, the thing, this thing. Oops, Let's see have I got it? Oh, I have yeah. This means that um, essentially 
in this particular area, this is the coast of Kerry, um, that, uh, sorry, in this particular area, the, uh, because of a number of conditions, including speeds, um, it produces, the county, uh, the north of Kerry produces 11%. I think just uh, approximately of the total wind energy in Ireland. Um, now, Scottish and Southern Energy, some of you may be involved uh, in working with them or collaborating with them, but they've um, also invested heavily in Ireland in terms of um, you know, in, in terms of developing these areas. Now, um, the first onshore wind farm in Ireland uh, uh, in, was 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 actually funded in 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 Galway in Inverin in Galway, and it's it's off it's in the in Connemara. It's the Gaelic part of Ireland. Now the reason why I'm actually including uh, some of these kinds of sites is because we had uh, a, a, an interreg program. Our group had an interreg program funded by the EU. Uh, uh, with the, the PI being based in the University of Ulster, included some, some of the, uh, including our group in Scotland and the University of Strathclyde, but also included some groups in the south, south of Ireland. So we were kind of going backwards and forwards um, between Ireland and the UK in terms of this project. But one of the things we did as part of this project was to organise a little bit of a trip around Ireland, to have a look at all the, the different uh, wind farms. Now, that's rather pleasant. It was actually... Uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the sort of late December, we had our trip a little bit frosty, not so frosty in Ireland because of the, of the, the kind of the more, uh, the more uh, sort of uh, temperate climate. But this, this, was, this was in the 1980s, funded by the EU. And I actually know the po politician. I, know, I knew the politician, not personally, but he's passed away now, uh, but um, he was a, a polo free. And he, he actually that was the first that was the first attempt at a, at a wind farm in Ireland. So I brought the group around anyway to um, to, to have a look at all these places, and um, uh, we ended up in we went in and we took pictures in this place. So um, well that was fine except, except uh, I did the students went in I I stayed put outside and suddenly a lady with a stick appeared waving at us and saying we were trespassing on the, on the area but of course she owed the land. Now that was fine for me because she was speaking in, in Gaelic, in Irish. I understood what she was saying but the rest of our, our students had no idea. Basically I explained what the situation was and all the rest of it so we actually managed to get away from that. She, she understood and we, that, was the, that was it. But, uh, but it was nice to see the history of the subject. Now what we have now, uh, uh, approximately 10 miles away, is the Galway Wind Park, which is the, the largest uh, wind park in Ireland. And it's all owned jointly between uh, SSE and Greencoat, I think, renewables. So that's, that's I think it's 174 megawatt wind, wind farm. Now, um, Okay, so those, so I just wanted to give you a little bit of a perspective of what's happening in, in, in Ireland and Britain in this field. And some of you will be familiar with the Dogger Bank, um, uh, uh, at least uh, uh, wind farm off the coast of the, uh, of, the of, of, of the east coast of the UK, and it's one, it's the largest uh, offshore wind farm in, in 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 Britain. Okay, so go, just going back to this, so. Basically, what's happening um, uh, in both countries is pushing forward, pushing forward in terms of these technologies, but we have got a lot of materials problems. Now, this is a, a different, uh, I didn't realize we'd have special effects on this slide, but that's great. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, this is um, uh, uh, at least um, a uh, it's a tidal turbine, and also in our group, we've got funding for tidal turbine erosion. Now, um, 
The technologies in, de in developing tidal turbine blades are fraught with difficulties because of the, you know, the very high thrust loadings at the leading edge, edges of the, of the blades, and also in deploying these kinds of turbines. Again, if you look, if you if you apply if you apply them, deploy them to scale, and you're testing them, you know, you're, you know, it, it, again, it's in the millions from from the point of view of uh, of 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 but if you lose the, 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 the kind of the, the, the kind of the kind of the testing testing device so to speak. Now in in the UK we have a fantastic resource uh, up in Orkney for testing these kinds of, of devices in at scale. Uh, it's called EWTEC. And basically uh, you can go up there if you if you develop your floating uh, wind turbine or your tidal turbine, you can go up there, um, up to the Orkneys and test these um, kind of devices. Uh, so what we have been uh, doing in, in, in the university, and we also, this was work that we collaborated with the uh, University of Southampton, uh, Robert Wood and Bakar Habahish uh, in, 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 in our university, Cameron Johnson and um, Steve Bull in, 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 in Newcastle. And we were worked, worked away at trying to solve these kinds of uh, issues and look at the how materials degrade. So we've got all sorts of different things on a tidal turbine. We've got a cavitation, uh, we've got erosion, we've got uh, uh, issues to do with biofouling uh, uh, as well as uh, corrosion and the interaction between erosion and corrosion. And this is just a press release of 5th of April this year. Um, they have announced that they are going to uh, to uh, at least look at getting a forcer license to facilitate a survey uh, on of uh, of an off a possible offshore wind farm in the Atlantic coast. So basically, um, that ha that's actually happened, and as we speak, they're they're doing the the marine survey, survey of marine life, mammals, etc., and that's actually happening at the moment. So that would be, a, you know, a major development. It would be the first offshore um, development on Ireland's Atlantic coast, which is, you know, um, it would mean a much higher uh, uh, capture of, of offshore energy. But again, there are all sorts of different materials problems that they would have, have to solve in the long term in, in order to ensure viability of this uh, of these uh, these wind farms of these offshore wind farms. Okay, so moving to Glasgow from Manchester in 2001 and, and to start Clyde University. I remember uh, when I first announced that I was going to be moving uh, all those years ago, um, I think well, somebody said to me, well, you know, you never, it's kind of, it's a little bit too far away and sure, we, we won't see you again. So um, that was before um, the big energy revolution started, the en renewable energy revolution started in Glasgow. And I was really absolutely very lucky um, to uh, get involved with a couple of CDTs. One of them was in wind and the other one was in medical devices. And um, I, two roads diverged in a yellow wood. I suppose I could have stayed put in Manchester, but I did think that I would be doing different things in Scotland, but I actually had never realised that yeah, there would be so many interesting projects to, to um, explore. And... Uh, I think the proximity to Nordic countries, you know, Denmark and Northern Ireland, obviously Belfast has such a distinguished his history of engineering. And uh, Denmark, we've had lots of contacts with uh, Denmark. Uh, and of course, that's the home of wind energy. All those kinds of things um, kind of conspired, if you like, to, to, to keep the, the, the kind of the research momentum uh, up and running and to sort of uh, to, to propel us for forward. Um, uh, uh, so to speak. So um, sometimes I think really like the message again to the younger people is, you know, all right, uh, it might, a decision you make at the time, it, it, might, it, it might be something people might say, all right, you know, I don't agree with it or I think, you know, you should go somewhere else. In fact, actually, I think probably it's probably a, very, a good decision and it gave me a lot of different sort of uh, different opportunities um, to, to, to move into different areas, you know. Now, the other thing about it was when I left uh, Manchester, it was, it was the University of uh, Manchester Institute of Science and Technology, I left a big rig 
experimental rig uh, set up. So basically, I had to start from scratch. And I always remember um, I discussed one or two things with a few people, including Mark G of NPL. And Mark said, uh, he said, don't go anywhere for 100,000. So sorry, I, I'm sure you won't mind me saying that. <laughs> like 100,000, 2001 was a lot of money, though. So they want that. Uh, if anybody knows anything about the Scots, no, uh, you know they're not. You're not going to get anything like that, even if you if you if you discount it in back to 2001. So you know, nothing like that was available long at all. But it was actually a good opportunity again because I actually had to, uh, you know, high temp the high temperature uh, erosion rigs that I was using in the Manchester work going to be available to me, or you know, it's going to be too, too difficult to do a lot of collaboration on them. So I had to actually start again. And Mark uh, suggested, well. All right, there's your budget. Well, it's not much. Uh, you have to have a word with George Clint. So I, I did, and George organized me with a micro abrasion uh, corrosion rig. And actually, that was hugely important because it got me, kept me going on the on the on the, the medical devices and the micro abrasion corrosion stuff. And I eventually bought a bought a much fancier rig from him a couple of years ago. And, you know, to just kind of a, a sort of thank you for for the for the for the basic rig that I could only afford all those years ago. Anyway, so the one the other thing about Scotland, and I'm I have to say I fly the flag for Scotland here. It's got Scottish engineering. I think uh, one of the one of the uh, chairs of Scottish engineering used to say the best uh, place to do engineering in the world, and I have to say I have to say such a stimulating environment, uh, Glasgow and Edinburgh and all the. The, you know, the, the, the combination of people in so many disciplines, but always, always pushing boundaries. But one of the things we have are five-year image projects. And one thing about these kinds of projects uh, um, is that the, we can actually try a lot of new ideas as part of the, these kinds of, uh, uh, these, this kind of setup. And, and that's quite interesting because, you know, can start to say, well, right, I, I'm going to try something, I'll try to look at a new coating or whatever, and you will get four or five months of, of research time. And students are always very interested in, in, in you know, some of the, you know, in, in, in taking on new ideas. And so that, that that's kind of, I think, helped a lot in recent years. Okay. And of course, I have to say EPSFC and EU to thank them for all their support. Okay, so just the UK generation mix. Just to go back to it, I just got this from the um, uh, National Grid website. Um, you can see again, we we we're still we have you know we've got a lot of uh, energy still from from wind. So you know we still there's still uh, it, it, it's growing all the time. And obviously there's lots of debates about um, uh, you know whether we need to to. With all with, with sort of political issues, we need to, to be uh, rolling back and going back into the oil and gas. I don't want to get into the, that debate really, but what I would say is that um, in order to move the renewable energies forward, we do need to understand materials problems. It is almost it is almost essential that we put more investment into into understanding um, the way materials degrade, the surface coatings degrade in wind and in tidal. Uh, energy and also to keep pushing uh, uh, to get uh, reliable wave energy converters uh, off the ground, and that's a that's a technology really that in on the materials area, in the materials area there's still an awful lot of work to be done. So I, I just think you know we were sort of saying right, okay, we've reached a little bit of a you know we've reached a little bit of a, a kind of a, a standstill in relation to maybe for, further development of some of these subjects for the moment. But if you look at the debates in COP28, uh, and if you look at some of, some of, the, some of the speeches in the last week, you will see that, um, you, know, the overwhel you know, the overwhelming kind of momentum is that we need to, 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 to consider, um, uh, you know, moving forward in these technologies. Because essentially, we're not, um, we're not, talking about uh, uh, ourselves, we're talking about um, the global context and the effect of what we do in terms of um, sustainability and also on how we use uh, materials in terms of, of, our, of the global context. Now, this is the, the average rainfall for the UK. You can see um, 
the, the, the west coast of Scotland and Wales um, much much higher rainfall rates. Um, and as I've said, we need to consider the global uh, context and sustainability. Um, uh, so because we're um, not, we're more fortunate in the UK uh, than other economies, which are very, very much dependent on uh, climate uh, issues and for survival, not just in order to do our daily, go about our daily business, but actual survival. And that has to kind of inform us and make us aware, you know, that we have to think wider than just our, our you know, our town, our a city, our country. We have to think, think globally as well. Okay, so those are the, I mentioned the days of rain, but this is the, these are the days of hail. You can see Scotland again, bits of Northern Ireland, um, very uh, uh, subject to uh, hail. So basically, if you think about these kinds of materials, right, that we're uh, generally, you know, that, that we're developing for, for these, for, for uh, uh, wind uh, uh, turbines, we also have to think about the the effects, the tribological effects of hail impact and raindrop impact. We're gonna we're in a situation whereby uh, we can't have one size uh, suiting uh, every environment, and this is what we've been looking at as part of our studies. Okay, so basically, um, I'm just going to, in terms of marine renewable technologies. Um, in the marine environment, we've got three percent. Uh, uh, sodium chloride and seawater. We've got energetic wave events. We've got rain and hail impact, and we've got erosion, corrosion, slash zone, and we've got possibility of fatigue and obviously corrosion assisting fatigue and interactions. So that's the kind of thing that uh, that uh, uh, an offshore wind structure will experience. Uh, if we just think about some of the tropological variables, uh, we've got the surfaces, we've got, if, if there's erosion involved, we've got the different aspects of the particles, and then we've got the materials problems, uh, issues. And the corrosion issues, you know, the electrochemical parameters, and then the concentration of anions. And if we've got any um, uh, uh, materials additions, which can affect the, the, the rate of passivation or the formation of the passifil, and also, Obviously, we've got coatings, different kinds of coatings, and the the, um, the, the, the properties of, of the materials, whether they're a ceramic or a, or a composite. So this is just a, an, an example of erosion, corrosion of a pipe. Um, one of the, the earliest, this is uh, uh, the kind of the poor bay, the, the French scientists developed these uh, poor bay diagrams of, uh, in the 50s as part of his PhD thesis. Now for the younger people again, um, I will say that um, uh, it's the atlas of uh, corrosion and it's widely accepted now as, as a kind of a, a basis for understanding corrosion. There's all sorts of different permutations of it now. But um, uh, when he developed it, in, he was a Belgian scientist, when he developed it, uh, it took a long, long time to do. And uh, the, the, the thesis supervisor said, um, sorry, no, we're not accepting it for your thesis and we're, we're failing your thesis. OK, so. Right. Did he just throw in the towel and get a job in the bank? Sorry about this. This is the city of London. But anyway, <laughs> no, not at all. He persisted, persisted, and he worked away with the uh, Corrosion Institute in uh, Suffolk in, in in Belgium and uh, and uh, eventually got his, uh, his work published and these diagrams became the basis of understanding aqueous corrosion. So, you know, if something doesn't go right, okay, don't throw the towel in, don't give up because you never know, you could be a world famous person at the very end, uh, like poor Bay, everybody talking about him, uh, mentioning him uh, in, in their talks, if they talk about aqueous corrosion, they usually mention the poor Bay diagram. Okay, now, uh, this, this, Diagram appeared in 1987, and it was from uh, uh, Mike Ashby's group, Seishun Lim, and uh, who's a PhD with Mike Ashby in uh, the engineering department in Cambridge. And it was the first attempt to mathematically generate a, a wear map, and uh, all these different kinds of re regimes were identified, influenced by the fact of 
um, influenced by the, the rule of frictional heating and the formation of oxide and the, and the competition between those processes and then uh, the wear uh, of the oxide in a situation where we're starting to get very at very high flash temperatures, we're getting very ductile. It was a, a very significant development in the field, uh, and, and again, it, it became a part of the kind of the 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 engineering and uh, uh, what I, was, I suppose folklore, so to speak. You know, the Ashby map came along, and it, it changed a lot of people's thinking in the subject. Okay, so um, what we were trying to do uh, this is the polarization curve showing the active passive transition for orange. The very simple. What we've been trying to do in our group over the years is develop these erosion corrosion maps and define different boundaries. And eventually we developed something like this in 1997, which was a, 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 a sort of a combination of, it, of an erosion map and a, and, and a poor bay, a, a poor bay uh, um, diagram. Uh, so basically kind of like putting those ideas together. And we did it, we've done this for uh, lots of different materials, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, okay, so if we just go back to low carbon carbon technologies, we've got a range of devices. We've got multi-parameter problem, and we have to think about microclimates because I've shown you the earlier slides all the different uh, climate variables, uh, cli microclimates around the UK and Ireland. So we have to think about having some um, adaptation for uh, the climate. Uh, and can we actually generate smart materials for those kinds of environments? Okay. So this is just an example of with the pipe again. We've done some three-dimensional mapping um, of the, this kind of pipe and looked looked at the effect of different pHs on the on the surface. So just it's a sort of a three-dimensional representation of all those kinds of uh, regimes that we saw in two dimensions in the in the in the earlier slide that's on the right hand side there. So, uh, okay, going back to our rainfall map, right, and our days of hail, God, it's very, very, um, it's very uh, uh, poor weather in the north of Scotland. I'm going to just tell a little bit of a story now because I remember when, I, when um, the late Professor Johnson from, from uh, the great friend of John's, um, uh, when, he, when I heard, he heard I was going um, to Glasgow, the first thing he said to me, you'll never stick the weather. <laughs> so, and, and how right he was. So, basically, <laughs> so he, he, he was, I was, I remember we were in a conference in Washington, I think it could have been, uh, it was one of the, I was at Washington, in Washington, it was a Gordon conference, I think. <laughs> never stick. So anyway, not to worry. I had a, I had a little bit of a plan to be uh, uh, sort of near closer to the equator, which I deployed <laughs> to get to get to to to, to, to go for the weather, but not, not to worry. Anyway, uh, so you can see these kinds of environments. So you know, very uh, uh, sort of challenging. And you look at this our offshore wind uh, uh, turbine and our tidal turbine. So basically. Um, so basically, basically we're, we're in a situation whereby different materials for different environments. And, it, it, you know, the way, now, I mean, I, I can't speak for the materials developers, but, you know, I think because, you know, it's, it is, you know, this the subject and the technologies are, are continually developing. I think there's, there's, there, there needs to be a little bit more awareness of the fact that, you know, that some of these, it's, the erosion rates are going to be a lot different in different environments. Now, tidal energy resources, um, uh, the, um, uh, in this particular um, uh, area in, in, uh, in, in Scotland, uh, it's the Sound of Islay. This is one of the most energetic areas for, for tidal energy. Now, right, okay, that's fine. Everything goes in the garden. The developers do the, um, they do the site assessment and they have to do the um, environmental assessment. That takes a long time, environmental assessment. But you've got to think also that um, you can have uh, sediment uh, in the water and that can cause erosion. So you've not just got the, the salt, you also have the sediment in the water and that those, those kind of conditions can cause erosion. Now, 
The great thing about uh, satellite mapping is that you can actually uh, you can actually uh, uh, identify uh, concentrations of sediment around um, uh, around the uh, you know uh, the coast, and that provides a means. Satellite data uh, provides a means of actually uh, uh, identifying where you might get the materials issues. So you just have to, I suppose, think about you know. Right, we might think, right, we don't need the satellite scientists. We do, because they're, they're providing the meteorological data that tells us how much materials could potentially wear. And we can use that for modelling. And also it can tell us, you know, how, how many particles are in a metre cubed uh, concentration of water, which, are, which can cause erosion damage. So, you know, if we can try to kind of join these kinds of communities together, potentially we can, can solve, you know, make progress in solving the, the, the issues. OK, so this is just a, a sort of a taster of a work that we did, uh, or the Rekesm project that, um, I'm just looking at the watch here now, um, that we did, just 10 minutes, yeah, that we did with um, uh, uh, on tidal materials. And I'm just going to skip through this briefly. Um, uh, it's, uh, we, had, we had a fairly, fairly kind of... Uh, uh, a sort of a clear notion of what we wanted to do. We want to reduce the cost of the materials. We got it funded in uh, 2013. Basically, I'm just going to show you some things that we did. This is just a, some sort of, uh, uh, this is the, again, lovely to see the special effects on, the, on this, because they were never, they were never planned. And, uh, <laughs> so, uh, I, at least, uh, you know, you know, this is an all singing, all dancing kind of a thing here, so I'm delighted. But anyway, um, it, this is what we did. We developed this device for um, sort of a slurry pot for uh, for testing the erosion, and we did some CFD modelling. And these are some of our materials. Sorry, this is the um, okay, the okay, the um, mechanical properties I'm giving, but it's just. It's, the coating as well, and we just looked at different kinds of conditions. So I'm just only going to skip through this. So we did get a change in the in the erosion as a function of um, the impact angle. That's not surprising uh, for our composite and our coating material. So we looked at two things: a composite and a coating. But I suppose the kind of the message or the takeaway from this really is obviously coatings will work better in these conditions. And most of these materials, these composites that are used, polymer-based composites. Uh, in, uh, on the on the tidal and the wind turbines, uh, are at least are, are generally coated for protection. The problem is some of the paint companies will not guarantee the coating beyond a certain length of blade. And one of them came just a couple of years ago, so they explained the story. No, 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 we, we're not going to ensure that the blades beyond a certain level. So they had a good look at one of our apparatus. <laughs> I think that was the way they were going to actually uh, try to see if they can, uh, you know, maybe, uh, you know, optimize their coatings. But, um, you know, that was, the, that was the thing they were very concerned about, you know, the, 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 the erosion for the very large turbine blades. Okay, so we got some particles on the surface if we got um, in, the, in, in, the, in the sodium chloride solution. And then um, we, this is the coating, the, the coating has much less wear on the surface by, by comparison to the material. Um, so what we did see was the, the effect of seawater in enhancing the, the, in the, the erosion and these have also been seen in corrosion fatigue studies. And the corrosion fatigue studies and the cavitation studies uh, were carried out in Newcastle and Southampton. And the, we had, by combining the insights from the different studies, we had a really nice uh, a sort of, uh, Kind of an overview of where we were at in terms of understanding what was going on at the surface. But we did see a very significant effect of seawater on the degradation of these polymer based uh, uh, composites. Um, we saw an effect of, 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 uh, of um, a reduction in the erosion rate through the use of coatings, but still further work needs to be done in, in, in this field. So we generate these tidal. Uh, erosion maps um, and for the composite and the coating and this is just sort of these are sort of wastage maps. I just want to pay the tribute to my, my postdoc the, who, who led this work along with his 
Palig Sian Sharifi, and uh, Gulam, um, he was uh, he was a mature student, and he did he's published he published some great papers. But he passed away in the first wave of the COVID. I would like to pay tribute to him, and I'd also like to pay tribute to Patrick Hopsipian, who uh, was just passed away recently um, in from Sheffield Hallam University in um, just um, at the start of the semester. Just to say they were really um, great collaborators and really part of what we we've been, we were doing in this field. Okay, now we're back to the special effects on a lighter note. So, um, as you see here, um, so these things, these this tiny, these tiny turbines, this uh, technology, as I said earlier, um, has has had difficulties in terms of the longevity of the turbine blades. Um, uh, now, to give you an example. In one particular instance, and I draw from an Irish uh, example as well, because I, at one stage I was external examiner in University College Dublin Mechanical Engineering. And uh, uh, one of the professors there, Jerry Byrne, was um, he was uh, uh, involved in a company called Open Hydro. Does that, does that make sense to anybody or has anybody heard about, of it? But it was a, sort of an iconic design of a tidal turbine. But anyway, uh, they did all sorts of testing on the and and um, optimization of the turbine blades, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and eventually deployed it to the Bay of Fundy in Canada. Okay, which you know, Newfoundland, uh, not the most hospitable environment. But anyway, uh, unfortunately, the the turbine uh, disappeared into the into the Bay of Fundy. So uh, apologies to anybody from uh, from that part of the world woods if you're listening to this lecture, but. You know, there was a good end to the story because the French, DFNES, is it DFNES? The French, the French the semi-state uh, uh, organization, and they actually bought the company for a finish. Um, and uh, I think that they're still working on the technology. So, all right, it wasn't a good. I think they actually thought because of the length of time, they thought that the, they, they had kind of sorted out the technology. But anyway, not to worry. Um, it was one of the things that happened, and it's a kind of a, a part of again the development story of these devices. Okay, so go back, go back to our offshore wind turbine and our and our uh, our, our leading edge erosion issues. If we look at our rainfall annual average and our days of hail, we can combine these insights um, to uh, develop a kind of these weather maps uh, for uh, these kinds of uh, conditions, and then. Looking at what we can do in our laboratories, and this was developed by our fifth years. Uh, uh, I think on a budget of five hundred pounds many years ago, they got five hundred pounds to develop this. Our fifth year students in Strathclyde Mechanical, and uh, anyway, uh, Jim Boy of uh, Professor Jim Boy, um, who was a mechanics expert, uh, uh, did, did the strength testing uh, of the. Of, and he did the, he checked the stress calculations. But anyway, it started us on our way in terms of raindrop erosion. But we were very lucky to get involved in a big energy storage project with um, led by Neil Hewitt of University of Ulster. And basically that's what we've got now for raindrop erosion testing in Strathclyde. We can test up to 200 meters per second on that, that rig. Okay, now not without its issues, uh, a little, uh, a specimen holder went kind of, it sort of uh, went in, in its own uh, direction in the initial testing, causing a, a side issue with uh, the, the various people who have the, the uh, kind of the um, uh, the authority to kind of check this thing. So we, we, we sorted it out, but it's it's still being developed. But you know we're almost there with it. Okay, so what we did was we um, worked away on our erosion testing and. Uh, based based on a, a sort of uh, on on our analysis of the weather maps, we developed a kind of an algorithm for um, uh, erosion rates, uh, leading edge erosion rates around uh, Ireland and the UK. So that was one of the things that we we've, we've done and we published in two thousand and twenty one. And you can see obviously. The higher erosion rates 
coincide with the with the, with the you know the, the more challenging um, uh, uh, weather environments. And that's what we would have expected from the earlier maps that I showed you. Okay, so um, right. That was why we published the paper. There was just more, it was a correction we had to make because there's misinterpretation. It was the leading edge erosion rates, and um, you know we we're talking all this talking about the leading edge erosion rates, which is ten percent of the blade. But anyway, again for the younger people, what happened afterwards then is that uh, we had a, an email from Norway, uh, an environmental group had picked up the paper. And it, uh, you know, a couple of emails. Can we use your data? Can we use your data? But now the report wasn't refereed. So this, uh, this, uh, don't worry, during this, I was at a conference, and uh, I think it was weird materials, uh, uh, and uh, got the, the, one of the students said, "There's three journalists on the phone," and I said, "What?" <laughs> so basically, it was all about this report by this environmental group in in Norway, and. Uh, uh, anyway, we clarified the issue. But I suppose the takeaway from this is right, okay, you generate a paper and you do something, you, you probably have no idea that it will have an impact in, in other countries, and that's great. Um, they got the subject, we, we started talking about the, this area uh, with some of the Nordic groups again. And the nice thing about it now is that I think, in terms of this kind of approach, um, We've we, the Netherlands and Denmark have published papers that kind of map their various uh, the erosion rates uh, around their countries. You know, for, with a focus on 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 wind uh, uh, wind turbine erosion. So it's sort of kind of got us all uh, chatting and maybe trying to work kind of like a little bit not collaboratively, but we're keeping an eye on what we're doing and having a kind of similar approach. And the west and that's also been done for the west coast of the states. Now, in terms of the journalists, it didn't just go to the journalists. Somebody said, I, I got one email, I have, I have a wind turbine outside my, uh, outside my office here in, uh, I think somewhere in Stockholm. And uh, is it going to wear away at the rate of knots or something like that? That was the thrust. <laughs> and somebody else said, somebody else said uh, an email came from France, well done, you show them. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, we've had that sort of these guys. Of, so you're working away. You don't really think your work is going to be, have an, a, you know, have an impact in your academic subject. So, but it might have an impact in other areas. And what this has uh, sort of got a little bit of a debate going on is plastics pollution in, 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 in you know, in the groundwater and the seawater. Should we, we have to think about that as well? We're talking about energy efficiency, but what about it? The marine environment. We, you know, all the subjects are interlinked, and we've got to think about things in a holistic way. So, um, uh, not with said that, I have got three. I had three emails to answer to in relation to those papers. And can you clarify what you said and what you did not say? In all right. So, anyways, that's just a, just a, just a byway and a takeaway. Never, never um, forget that your your work will have a much wider influence than you possibly can think. This is some work we did in 2000, just um, during the COVID, but we're, we're just working on the paper now, it's for hail impact, and we've been looking at defamation maps for hail. So just to say, uh, just to conclude, tribal corrosion issues, they're becoming more increasingly important and um, uh, in the renewable energy area, and you know, these kinds of maps can be very useful in identifying um, the best way to optimise materials. So that's just uh, these kinds of hail impact uh, uh, and examples of hailstones you can see here, you know, you can get very large hail impact hailstones and you can, you know, these can be uh, very detrimental to these kinds of devices. Now, um, the International Tribal Corrosion Network um, was set up in 2001 with Robert Wood and the late Anne Neville, and we eventually got to 30 countries involved and 100 mem members. Now, there's a bit of a technical issue with the network at the moment. Uh, you won't be able to see it online. We're just fixing it. But it's something that led to the first turn in tribal corrosion. Um, and we've now got a side score of 5.8 in we're still working on getting an impact factor, but we you know it's a respectable enough side score. So I just want to acknowledge a couple of people here, all the people who kind of been helping over the, the years. And uh, just I started with a quote from uh, uh, from uh, 
uh, Robert, uh, Robert Frost, uh, Sir Robert, Sir Robert Frost, sorry, isn't it? <laughs> two roads I've developed, developed uh, are two roads uh, um, diverged in the yellow wood, sorry, uh, with, with, with apologies to, 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 to the late Robert Frost. And working at the difficult problems over, you need to possibly think about taking the road less traveled by you. The really persevering at the difficult problems. I think that's probably what we try to do uh, in my group. We always try to, to try to, to do the things that were, you know, that possibly, you know, that might be a bit intractable, but we just felt, well, you know, that might, you know, I always felt we should be moving the subject further. And uh, going back to Fairy Tale in New York uh, uh, and the poetry of, of the late Shane McGowan, can't make it all on my own. I think that was one. That's another line from the song. And uh, collaboration can help to move across boundaries. I have to say, um, I had to be encouraged to collaborate all those years ago. You know, it's like, can't you work with a couple of people? But actually, that's really has 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 helped my career greatly. But also, I think it's been such fun to work uh, in collaboration with others. It's always a bit of fun, and you know, the ups and the downs and all the rest of it. But I have to say, uh, that's really. Uh, without my collaborators, my research group really, I will, you know, I, I, you know, it, it would, my career would have been not not at all, at all as enjoyable, and I think is is worthwhile. Okay, so um, that is all I have to say, and I hope I kept the time to time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Margaret. I have to say, I just say a hundred before I, I leave. Sure. I, I, I at least. Um, Years ago, I was at a, a sort of my father persuaded me to go to a history lecture by um, the late Professor John A. Murphy of University College Cork. And uh, the, the way they did it in Ireland in those days was at the end of the, the lecture, he would, you know, he would sing a song. So <laughs> the kind of the way that we do things over in this part of the IRC. But um, uh, so I didn't sing a song, but I did quote from the song. So I'm kind of like slightly sticking to my Irish roots. OK, thanks. Thanks very much for your attention. <laughs> um, Stephen, a very personal and enthusiastic account of your lifetime journey with Cry Both Road. It's just amazing. It's great to hear. So yeah. we have some time for some questions. Um, I was just checking. I don't think we have anything online at the moment, but if um, we have yeah. any questions. Okay. Hi, thank you very much for your talk and congratulations on the award. And it was great as an early career researcher to hear your presentation of your stories and your um, advocacy for collaboration. I think that is really something that I think we can just want to really carry on with. My question is around your weather maps and the thinking about preparing for climate change. A lot of my research is in rail and one of the buzzwords at the minute is preparing for climate change. Is that something that you're looking at in terms of the weather's going to get crazy potentially, yeah. sea levels are going to rise, how is that going to impact? It's, 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 would you believe it's very important because um, and it's another story. I was, I was in, uh, on holiday in France years ago and I got an email during Easter from an, an Australian um, um, rail sort of researcher. And he said, um, we're having problems, um, awful problems with leaves on lines. And we noticed, uh, and, you know, and corrosion again. And, you know, can, can you just give us some insights? And, uh, and he said, in the tunnels, we have nothing like that at all. Everything is fine. Now, what, what are we going to do about it? You know, so he was so, I think they, they were so the kind of, Grappling with the situation so much, uh, and it was such a, a, a kind of a difficult problem that uh, I eventually ended up meeting him at least to discuss the problem. Rail, rail, railways um, during my Easter was it my, during my Easter holiday? It was the most bizarre thing ever. But it's obviously they, you know he, he he was looking at corrosion people and thinking I have to get the solution. So um, that's really really important. Now I didn't mention. You know, in terms of so you you have to think about the problems of flooding. You've you've got to think about corrosion, and also um, you know if you think about you know monitoring sea levels, are they going to have to change the rail infrastructure? Do you know what I mean? Are they going to have to change the you know the way that the lines are routed, etc., based on sea levels? 
So there's all there's a huge area there. I think. I mean, we all have been affected by flooding in the last, uh, you know, in, in the last while, and uh, and obviously in the global context, so many different different uh, issues there. So um, in terms of um, Winter, yeah, yeah, almost certainly because you know, e you know, even with the temperatures, I didn't mention things like degradation of polymers and UV, you know, I, I didn't mention that aspect today, but that's a, that's a huge issue. So, you know, you've got that, you and also you've got deformation and you know, the kind of high temperature spots and these, these, I mean, they're rotating at very high velocities, you're going to have heating. Yeah, uh, and basically, well, also, you know, what, what, what effect is that going to, going to have a, at the contact, etc. You know, so um, uh, all of uh, you know, the, the, I suppose from the point of view of the the devices, you've got the effect of climate change, but also you have our ability if we um, tailor with materials to kind of uh, to 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 to. to to deal with the climate climate issues, um, we can, you know, we can promote sustainability and, and have the energy independence. You know, it won't suit every kind of a, an application, but I suppose the thing really what we have been, you know, what's really been kind of very important for us in recent times is, you know, energy independence. You know, uh, and uh, you know that in, in times of you know, strife or whatever, you're going to get very big hikes in, 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 in different sources of energy. But if we can actually, if we can you control our own energy usage and, you know, and develop our own energy devices, we have a degree of independence. And I think, you know, that's a very, very important for these kinds of, in these times. So, um, yeah, I, I but I myself would think that the funding councils need to address these issues. It needs to be a, 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 a sort of a higher on their agenda because I know they're putting a lot of money into manufacturing at the moment. That's a huge driver, but really they should be. We, we haven't solved the problems just because these things are out in the water, you know, or whatever. We haven't solved the problems. What's going to happen in five years' time when they have to start, with, uh, 10 years' time, when they have to start replacing them? So, we, you know, that would be my message. You know, um, to, to, to them, they forgot to kind of keep rolling out the, the grants. Um, in terms of the EU situation, uh, Horizon Europe now is is back on track. Isn't that correct? Because the because the EU has been really really uh, constant in, in funding these areas. So I think I would encourage everybody to think about the EU and keeping up with European collaborators to keep driving this forward. So uh, I also want to say, okay, that's. The other questions? Well, thank you very much. It's a kind of related area, and, and it's partly inspired by the fact that I'm about to start a project where we're looking at uh, droplet erosion within turbo machinery. Yeah. Um, I mean, you've got these lovely rainfall maps and hail maps and erosion maps and so on, but it seems to me the number of variables are actually quite large. I mean, yeah. the, the, the actual erosion you get will depend on the size of drops, yeah. the, um, kind of angle of impingement yeah. and, and, yeah. and all, all sorts of things. I mean, is it is it possible to know what a particular turbine blade actually sees? Uh, in, 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 or, or do you just have to base it on sort of macroscopic uh, climate minimum? I think, I think that's probably the way to start, but I mean, you could think about combining variables, you know, um, Having you know using artificial neural networks, and, you know that's probably the way you know that that that's the kind of the best way forward. You know, in terms of you know doing the approaching the, the modeling aspect. Yeah. Okay. No, okay. Yeah. okay. Bye. 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 Time. <laughs> so we have a question online. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, it's asking. Comment on the correlation between the particle density and material loss. Um, in terms of the the, the erosion particle density, I think so. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, generally speaking, in in terms of the erosion models, we we generally have we generally incorporate particle density as part of the equation. So there are well there were there are well established models in the literature that would 
that would uh, account for that. So it always has to be taken into account. But I, I, you know, there are other, you know, for for example, particle shape can cause an issue. Sometimes that's not, not taken into consideration. Are, I think people are getting people are getting um, wanting to get home to their train. No, no, that it's it's. I'm I'm I understand because um, yeah. um because I've been, I've I've kind of been travelling myself, so I I do, I do understand that you know trying to get it get to to get to or mass travel in the region, especially. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Um, yeah, I've got a question. Um, is like the tidal turbine? Is it different to like the gas turbine um, blade? Because obviously, like a plane goes up in the sky yeah. and it meets with the cloud and all that. So is it? So is is a is the erosion of a tidal blade? Is it different to that from normal like? Yeah. So 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 basically, yeah. in the tidal, the big difference is the the uh, you know the de the density of water being so much higher than air. So it, it's you know because of that, it's about a thousand times you know the force at the at the at the at the, at the uh, leading edge is a thousand times greater than if you were if you were in air. So that's the big difference in, in terms of the you know the kind of the endurance that, uh, that we need to. Generate from 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 a tidal turbine by comparison to a wind turbine of the same, uh, you know, size. And like as you say, say for example, if you've got an airframe going up into the air, so that's the huge. That's that's really the reason why they're the developers are having real problems with type with rolling out those technologies because you know of that really really um, you know the high erosion rates uh, of those high erosion rates at the at the leading edge. Thanks very much. That's a good question. Thank you. Yeah. I, think I'm, so I think we probably ought to uh, yeah. draw that to it. Kind of, but I guess if people have got questions and also online if they want to follow up yeah. and do that, that's absolutely fine. It's, okay. Yeah, but, so thank, thanks very much for listening. And uh, as I say, like it's, it, you know, the it, it's kind of uh, starting out in your careers and as you're going along, you know, whatever, you might have a difficulty one year, but just keep going and keep going and uh, don't uh, grant application doesn't come through just you know you'll find funding another way that's the way I always used to, to work it anyway listen thanks thanks to everybody the eye making thanks Evie uh, for all of your organization oh, oh, sorry 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 and honor thanks very much for your for yeah. your for cheering and uh, and uh, really it was lovely to always meet up with our friends uh, today yeah. as well and uh I did manage to speak to uh, Ian. The last time I met Ian was in Hamelina in uh, Finland <laughs> at, at a conference there many, many years ago. Well, it was uh, pre-COVID, I think. Yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. Okay. Well, that's, that's brilliant. But no, I just like to sort of on behalf of the yeah. group committee, just thank you so much for coming today. Okay. I know you've, you've travelled a long way. Well. Yeah. But really appreciate the talk. I think I, it's been really, I love the enthusiasm of the way you delivered it. You've obviously had a, a great journey. Yeah. And also to hear like when you started out yeah. and where you ended up with the renewables. Yeah. I think that's a fascinating story. Uh, yeah. so I really appreciate that today. Yeah, well, thank okay. Thanks. thanks very much. Thank really, 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 it was lovely yeah. to be down here. And of course, things are starting to normalise now post-COVID as well. And, and it's just nice to see the cities, you know, sort of things happening again. So anyway. And I think there's a definite message as yeah. that we've got to look to the future. And that's, oh, yeah. That's that's the, I, think, I, think so. I think so, you know. But you know, I've worked in all sorts of different areas. Um, you know, oil and gas. Um, we did some work um, in the oil and gas area. You know, the, the the thing about all these kinds of energy, as you know, engineering problems, they're all transferable. You know, what you learn in one area is transferable to another area. You know, so it's kind of but we have to keep moving with these kinds of new technologies. We have to keep driving forward and you know put the investment in. I think that's so important. You know, you you're also made a really really good point. That yeah. These things seem new, but they're not anymore. And we've got to think about how it, we're going to retire and replace it, exactly. them. Exactly. Really yeah, exactly. Things. You know, how, how how are these things? How how can we um, sort of you know um, sort of plan for the future? And like I think I was saying earlier, that's the one thing. I mean, one of the people in offshore wind was saying to me recently, you just you know they're finding difficult to put a cost on the maintenance of the turbines. Okay, that's all material science. And I was saying, well, the material scientists all around the UK, they're 
they'd, be, they'd like to get interested in these kinds of uh, areas. Yeah. And it's the same for the, for the 